Hi everyone, welcome to this open portaled hour on Hair Moments. I am Leila, the Research Forum Programme Manager here at the Portald, and I want to start by saying the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially tonight's Open Courtauld event. Now, anyone who knows me quite well is aware that I am mildly to completely obsessed with my own hair, and this alongside the fact that during lockdown, we have spent hours on Zoom, seeing our own reflection on the screen, got me thinking about hair's visual potency in art historical material. How, as a result of this relationship, art can style out hair's special power to inform social norms. So associated in the Western canon of art history, traditional notions of beauty and fertility in women. For example, think about the abundant flowing visions of sensuous, alluring hair, as a focal point in movements like the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, artistic representations of hair and hairstyles can also illustrate a darker side to our discipline. So embodying one type of hair as the paragon of beauty imparts the barely hidden discrimination, stigmatization, oppression, cultural appropriation and follicular racism aggrandized through idolized hair types. So I'm excited then that this open quartal hour will interrogate the soon banality of hair in art history, its everyday presence making it the perfect vehicle to reproduce and feed into systems of control. And also this hour is to remind people to not touch other people's hair without their consent. So the format um, will be like a usual open court old hour, short segments, kicking off with a poem this time, then some presentations and ending with a panel discussion where I will ask any questions that you have to our wonderful participants. To get these to me, please use the chat function throughout the next hour. You can also send us any of your questions on social media with the hashtag Open Courtauld Hour. We are at Courtauld Res if you don't already follow us. Okay, on to the event. Up first, we have a familiar face from our very first Open Courtauld Hour back in April of 2020, I want to say, which was on art in isolation. And this is Shagufta Iqbal. She is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, workshop facilitator, and TEDx speaker. Her poetry collection, Jam is for Girls, Girls Get Jam, is one of Burning Eye Books' best-selling collections, and her poetry film, Borders, has won several awards and has actually toured internationally. Um, she sits on the board for Kate Farewell and is currently writing her second poetry collection and a debut novel. Shagufta has taken on a little known or discussed work housed by the portal, which we will pop up on the screen in just a few moments. She's going to reinterpret this piece in relation to hair, hair adornment and the exoticizing and homogenizing of many cultures in art history under this umbrella of Oriental. So hello again, Shagufta. It's fab hello. to have you on board for another Open Court Old event. And hopefully this time we won't have um, the same tech issues we had way back when we were all um, new to Zoom. So I wondered before we begin, if you could say a little bit about where you were coming from with this reinterpretation, what you actually made of this work and the fact that there was so little information I could give you about the artists and the women it depicts. I mean, to be fair, that's a standard response, isn't it, uh, about particularly the, 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 um, the person that's being depicted. And so I, I think I came to it from a very much of the point of view of um, the work of Gayatri Spivak, um, who's an Indian feminist. Um, and she wrote really well about this idea of when we are looking at historical text or we are looking at an image, that we need to look beyond what we see, beyond what's in front of us. Um, and we've got to look for what is missing because what is missing speaks to us the most. It's gonna tell us the most about what is happening. Um, and I think this poem came very much from that point of view. And also about my own personal journey with hair because being South Asian, it's a, it's a huge issue within our communities. Um, traditionally, I come from, uh, my ancestors are Sikh, um, but I've grown up in a Muslim family and, and household. So it's really interesting having that kind of relationship with hair being sacred to then having a Muslim response to being somebody who is able to cut their hair. Um, these are the kind of background musings I had um, about this topic. So I couldn't speak on behalf of all cultures because I think in, in many ways it would be 
wrong for me to do that, but looking at the way in which Indian hair particularly plays a role in a global context of hair politics, I think is something that I'm really, really interested in exploring. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. So what I'll do is I'll pass it over to you to get started and we'll pop up the slide with the image so everyone can see. Thank okay. you. So here you have the image um, and uh, my poem is called Sir Bolton and it is dedicated very much to the, to the writing and the work of Gaytree Spivak uh, who talks about what's missing in the image um, and it's very much focused like I said on my own personal experience uh, with my hair. <laughs> um, Sir Bolton. Today the smell of Amla Dil hangs in the bathroom. I am stood in front of the mirror and I tie my daughter's hair. I pull strands into my fist and I spread the thickness of oil into the sky. In 2017, I cut off a heart full of my hair. My sisters called it my Britney Spears moment. After all, I was going through a long drawn out divorce at the time. So I suppose looking back, the two must have been related. The things we do, huh? I guess in that moment, I wanted to feel the world differently on my skin. I gave the scissors to my daughter and we played hairdressers. I saw splintered shock reflected in my son's confused eyes while the luscious gobbling of strands into the mouth of the blade made me feel light. Suddenly my neck was exposed. I felt like my chest had expanded and I could take in air that for so long I'd been holding in. The teenager in me was giddy with rebelliousness. I remembered being young, lying with my head against the ground, bright green towel, soaking up my offering of hair, an iron in my right hand, finger pressed against the steam button, praying my curls into forced submission, hair that was too much for my small body, hair that I was not allowed to cut, my bowed over frame in a squared spot of afternoon sunlight, that window opened against the heat the smell of Amlatil hanging in the room. I ran my fingers through the silkiness. Finally, spread the thickness of oil into the sky. I had read somewhere that, in, that during colonial times, Indian prostitutes had their hair cut short. And this was to indicate that they served only the British regiments, railways, and of course, syphilis. I have read somewhere that beauty lies in these tendrils. I read somewhere that women engrossed in cinema screens, necks tilted towards soft light, walk out split in half, with their hair making its way across the oceans to the US. I read somewhere that Medusa held power in these twists, read somewhere that I should cover it all in veils, I read that I should smother it all in oil, that I should bury it in henna, that I should pat it with turmeric, but I should never, never, never cut it. The heaviness is supposed to mark me separate to the widows. They think something more sacred than life is carried in these tresses. So instead, I play hairdressers. I collage myself out of the magazines. I cut my way out of the Orientalist fantasy. I reimagine a whole new life when neck and shoulders are weightless. I reframe the gaze, look out beyond the heads, hold the pen in my hand and center myself. And then I walk straight out of the margins towards the point of light, following in the shadows of Mirabai, Fatima Alferi, Amrita Sher Gil, my feet covered in chopped curls, my hands bleeding splintered shards into the whole horizon, the entire erased history of the Indus ready for a new blank canvas, the smell of Amla Dil hanging heavy in the air. I run my fingers through the idea of flight. I spread the thickness of dreams into the sky. Finally, weightless. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. A really um, beautiful way to start thinking about hair in art history. And I think, it, yeah, so fantastic to have you start off this hour. And I imagine there'll be loads of questions for you when we get to the panel at the end. And um, so thanks again.
Um, now it's time for the next part of our conversation and we are going to be joined by Rachel Gibson to historicise the cuts of the Courtauld collection in more detail. Um, Rachel is like me and loves hair, but unlike me, she has more than 10 years expertise and experience working as an industry specific editor, as the hair historian, your go to hair obsessed expert for quotes, theory and insight into the history of hair and hairdressing. So the hair historian, if you don't already know, is an Instagram account combining her main interests of hair, art and history, and as well as platforming inspiration. It's also a way for Rachel to share her knowledge on the hairdressing industry and the trends, techniques and people that have established it throughout history. So thank you, Rachel, for taking the time to look at our collection through the lens of hair. I, you know that I've admired your work for ages and it's a real delight to have you come on to share your expertise. And if it's okay with you, I will hand over the imaginary mic so you can get started. Absolutely, nice to be here. And let me try and share my screen successfully, <laughs> which is always a challenge. Okay, so. All right, hopefully that's showing up properly for everybody. So as Leila said, my name's Rachel. I've worked in the hairdressing industry for about 15 years now, basically doing everything except cutting hair. So I'm an editor, a producer. I work with brands, I work with salons, I work with hairdressers to help them create content. But I also run The Hair Historian, which is my Instagram account, combining my two loves in life, which are hair and art. I launched this page about five years ago and through it, I've been lucky enough to work with lots of cool people and publications like the BBC, Time Magazine, Vogue, the Wall Street Journal, talking to them all about the social and cultural history of hair and how we can use it to tell us a bit more about life in the past. So tonight I've been asked to choose a few images from the Courtauld's collection and I'm going to use them as a starting point to talk about some interesting moments in hairdressing history. So let's take a look. So full disclaimer, I'm not sure if John Kenrick has pink hair in this image or if it's just how the image is rendering online. However, pink hair was a really interesting hair trend in the 1700s and plenty of men and women too opted for pink hair. Um, and I'm about to show you some of my all time favorite images which will kind of show you how this trend looked at the time. So here you can see a trio of incredible cameo portraits by John Smart evidence that pink hair was very much out of mode in the 1700s for both men and women. In fact, pastel hair of every shade was a fashionable choice. People choosing yellow, blue, purple, pink, whatever they wanted to complement both their outfit or their complexion, as well as their mood, much like we would do today. Um, and at this time, hair powder that was used to color the hair is also used much like we would use dry shampoo today. So to refresh the hair rather than having to wash it. Hair powder was made from wheat starch, which was dried and ground before being scented and coloured. So as well as having lovely pink hair, you'd also smell like roses or lavender or whichever fragrance you chose. And your hair powdering would be done in a powder closet where powder was blown onto your hair or your wig with a pair of bellows by a servant or maid while you protected your face with a conical mask, a bit like a plague doctor mask, if you can imagine it. There's a really great story of Prince Kaunitz, who was the Chancellor of Habsburg Empire, who would apparently line up two rows of attendants, 10 on each side, each armed with bellows, and he would then stroll down the middle of this aisle to get a really gentle covering of pink hair. So quite a spectacle, I'm sure. Um, hair powder was purchased in such vast sums at the time that a hair powder tax was actually passed in 1786, and it raised about a quarter of a million pounds in the first year alone. With so much hair powder being consumed, it's perhaps no wonder that it was very rightly criticized by society for being incredibly wasteful. And in countries where people were starving, it's definitely distasteful to see these vast quantities of flour and wheat starch being just blasted around for the sake of fashion. But that is kind of a common theme um, as we'll come on to next. So the topic of excess, we move swiftly on to the decorative hairstyles of the 18th century when you think about people like Marie Antoinette. This image here from the Courtauld's collection is actually from a bit later on and it's actually a caricature, but I do think women a century earlier would no doubt have been very enamoured by this look, even if they might have considered it was a bit small, a bit, a bit feeble by their standards. Um, so yeah, let's take a little look at the trend for big hair and even bigger accessories. On the left, you can see arguably the most famous style of the era. This hairstyle is called La Fraguette La Junion. Apologies for any pronunciation there. But what you can basically see is a model ship balanced on top of a towering hairdo. And this was created in tribute to a, a recent French naval battle at the time. Hairstyles here were used to convey messages, to show your political allegiances, or really just tell the world something about yourself. 
Um, and by the 1760s, hairstyles were incredibly large, incredibly intricate, and they were a really obvious example of conspicuous consumption, one man upmanship. Giant elaborate hairdos like this tell the world you're not someone who's partaking in manual labor. The more over the top, the more expensive your hair, the more impressive you look to the world, in theory, anyway. Um, hairdressers, hairdressers like this would be created with wool and padding, which would then be encrusted with lard and other animal fats, then baked to create a really solid finish. Um, a technique which didn't smell great, as you can imagine, and it also attracted mice. So you had these very grand women of the era sleeping basically upright with mouse traps around them to keep the creatures out of the hair, which is a great example of suffering for fashion. Um, this was a really golden era for hairdressers, as you can imagine, and we get the first celebrity hairdressers of the time becoming known kind of in Paris at this point. These people were known by their first names only. They demanded huge sums of money. Um, there's a couple of guys who are particularly synonymous with the era, Leonard, Antoine, two of the first big names of the era in Paris. And they actually set up some of the first formal hairdressing schools in Europe, providing professional training schemes and qualifications and lending respectability to hairdressing as an art form and a career choice, which is something that I'm really passionate about today is you know, making sure we respect people that do hair. Um, by the latter half of the 18th century, these coiffeurs were definitely art forms. I found a couple of descriptions of some of my favorite ones to read. So one court description tells us about a certain duchess whose hair was curled and powdered in a coiffeur three feet high, displaying a whole garden with a brook made of mirror, a jeweled clockwork windmill spinning away, flowers and grass. Um, Marie Antoinette was the other poster girl for these looks, as we can probably imagine. Um, her styles involved hundreds of meters of ribbons and flowers. And one of my favorite descriptions described a garden theme style which she chose, which apparently was composed of artichoke, cabbage, carrot and radish arranged around her head. Um, a couple of other favorites of mine include styles which had cages on top with live singing birds, urns with the ashes of your loved ones, and even glow worms to add light and create something which must have looked incredible, I'm sure. Um, so it goes without saying, these hairstyles attracted the attention of the press who loved creating caricatures depicting the increasingly elaborate styles which were fast preventing women going about their daily lives. People had to sit on the floor of the carriages because they didn't fit in them. They caught themselves a light on candle chandeliers and they certainly prevented you doing very much, although that was kind of the point. After the French Revolution, the grotesque extravagance of these wigs suddenly starts to really out of place and there's a profound change in hair fashion for styles which were much more simple and understated and I'm going to touch on that next. So I'm just going to jump forward a tiny bit and talk about in the 1920s which is when we see women in the west cutting their hair short for really the first time. I think it's kind of easy to assume that everyone in the 1920s was a flapper running around with like a slick glossy bob but Sure hair was still very scandalous and it was a high fashion look. It wasn't something that everyone was doing until a little bit later on at least. And many women would have kind of faked the look by just pinning their hair under and then styling it in waves like we see in this image here from the Courtauld's collection. So jumping back in time momentarily to where we left off with the French Revolution, there was a short lived trend in France for women to wear their hair a la victime, which we see on the left here. It's a very short cut. So while it does reflect this more sombre, serious movement in style after the excesses of the previous decades, it is quite gruesome. Um, so women going to the guillotine would have had their hair cut short so they could be decapitated. And that is what this style was created in tribute to. Um, so it was also complimented women of the era who chose this look would wear like a thin red ribbon around their neck to kind of symbolize the dotted line almost. So yeah, quite a dark trend. But yeah, apart from the victim cut in the West, you don't really see short hair as a trend for women until incredibly recently. Um, long hair has historically been linked with their ideas of femininity, fertility, youth, marriageability. And particularly in the Victorian era, we saw women growing their hair as long and as thick as possible. Um, some of the most famous stylists of the Victorian era were the Sutherland sisters who appeared with Barnum and Bailey's throughout the 1880s up to sort of the 1900s. And I'm just gonna show you a picture of them because I feel like everyone needs to see it. So it looks a bit like a cult. Um, <laughs> the collective length of their hair was 37 feet long. It was really the Victorian ideal of long, natural, thick hair, seemingly untouched, just growing magically. And they had their own ad campaigns. They had their own ranges of products. They were received thousands of fan letters. Um, they really were hair celebrities. Um, so, yeah, I kind of wanted to just mention them because it really puts into perspective how scandalous it was at the start of the 20th century to then see women cutting their hair really short. It was a total outrage to much of society. 
And there are stories of fathers suing barbers for cutting their daughter's hair. They were very much under the impression that your daughter would be unmanageable with short hair. And obviously at the time that means, well, what's the point? Why, why exist? Um, and I say barbers purposefully because most hairdressers at the time didn't really cut hair, they were hairdressers, they were dressing hair. Um, so women at the time had to go to the barbers to get their hair cut off. Um, and you see that in the middle shot here, which is one of my all time favorite images. I don't know how much of it you can make out, but it's from a hairdressing magazine in 1924. And it says, if you must do it, show this to your barber. Just the real loathing, you can see, feel it coming off. And the other newspaper story shows some of the others kind of scurrilous stuff that went out in the press about short hair at the time people getting these headaches because they had short hair for the first time. They really did outrage people. And aside from being so different to what had gone before, short hair also symbolized freedom, which is something that probably helps to explain why people disapproved. Young women with cropped hair weren't beholden to a weekly or daily hairdresser trip. They could run, they could ride a bike, they could generally enjoy a freedom that wasn't afforded to previous generations. And today we seemingly have much more choice over how we choose to wear our hair, but there are, it's not the case. There are countless examples of hair discrimination still in existence and it's very much an ongoing battle to reach a place where everyone can wear their hair as they please without comment and I think some of the other great speakers tonight are probably going to touch on that so I'm going to leave it there. Amazing, thank you Rachel. Now I'm going to be going to bed thinking about putting glow worms on this little headband I have on and how great that would look. I think it would look <laughs> awesome. I just took there, yeah, maybe not a great idea. Well, thank you again. And I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions for you. We've got a few in social media already. So yeah, everyone keep adding your questions and we'll get to them at the end. Um, now we are moving on from the Portal collection and I am thrilled that we are able to showcase the amazing work of Serena Lee. So founder of Inclusive Histories, an Instagram account under the name George and Diaspora, Serena will take the time now to delve into her arsenal of discoveries into hair adornment. Serena's research and social media accounts provide an essential digital museum of historic images of multi-ethnic peoples. Serena was also involved in the Seeing Ourselves project at the Maritime Museum, which I highly recommend you all explore after this event. So thank you, Serena, and welcome to the virtual court hall. How are you? Hi. I'm really good, Leila. Well, what I'll do is I'll pass it over to you now to get started. So thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Everyone see that? Yeah, that looks great, thank you. Okay. Okay, so yeah, thanks again, um, Leila, for inviting me to talk today. Right, um, so today I will give an overview of um, some great Afro hairstyles and hair dominant images from my Instagram page. And then I'm going to delve into some research um, that I've been doing um, um, on Caribbean head wraps. So with inclusive um, histories, um, my page looks in particular at multicultural images. I began with portraiture from the 18th century, hence the name Georgian diaspora. But then as I was um, getting more images, I started to find some through uh, the centuries. Uh, and then I started to include photographic portraits as well. What I do is I slow read the images and then my focus is on dress, adornment and deportment. But with many of the images, what I find is the research, um, the subjects, the sitters are, um, and the details about them are really ever told and quite important. So that's why I like to share um, about their lives. Um, case in point, Zaga Christ or Zaga Christ, that's the uh, miniature um, in the corner there. Now, I mean, he's like a rock star to me. Um, you can see him with that beautiful head of hair. This was painted, this is a miniature which was painted in 1635 by a female court, court painter, Giovanni Gazzani. Um, it's, it's an amazing little piece. Um, and with me researching how he's dressed and how he looks, I actually was able to put together the style that he's got with the moustache and the Afro hair with um, the Afro-Asiatic Afro period. Um, 
of the 16th century right up until the 19th century and still uh, tribes still have that same style. If you look on that first image, that's actually the same style with the moustache and, um, and the afro. So next to him is a unknown young lady um, painted by Jean Etienne Lyotard. Now people have always um, compared this to the girl with the pearl earring. Now I've been looking at this for a few years now and actually what they've just recently found out is that the paper that she was painted on or the canvas um, has a watermark from the Netherlands. So that does tie in with the Vermeer um, painting, uh, the girl with the pearl earring. Maybe he, the, the artist was um, inspired by the pearl earring painting. But also um, what the Met Museum, who's been researching this image, has found out that the head wrap that she wears is actually um, from a Caribbean hairstyle, a Caribbean style. Um, so underneath Zaga Christ, uh, there's a pre-Raphaelite model, um, Fanny Eaton. She's got that rope, blue ribbon rope um, around her hair, and it's a beautiful image. She was a prolific artist for the pre-Raphaelite bro Brotherhood. Um, she was Jamaican um, and brought up here in Britain. Um, I just love uh, some of the images of her. And also, I mean, she's always very posed and very composed in her images. And I just like this kind of irreverent image she's got there, which is kind of focused on her beautiful mane of hair. So next to her is a lovely image of a woman in a deep midnight blue um, dress with this beautiful gold jewelry and gold hair, hair adornments. Um, but the thing is, the beads were just not ornamental. With some research, I found out that um, the candoble, an Afro-Brazilian religious tradition, considered beads um, as spiritual and therefore an essential component of being close to the god, being close to the goddess. Um, it's, it's, it's a lovely. I'm constantly kind of fixated on that image. I want to find out more. Um, and then at the top there, you've got Selika. Levinsky, a Parisian equ equestrian. Um, that's such a, a striking image. Um, she's so statuesque and she just embodies this timeless spirit. Um, that was actually one of the first photographic images I put on Georgian diaspora. And it got lots of engagement. I mean, it's just amazing. And it was just through looking at this image that I um, learned so much about the riding um, habit, the actual um, clothing, the costume that she's wearing. And then below that, I've added uh, Harriet Gibbs Marshall with her coiffed hair and a velvet tie. I don't know if you can see it actually, she's got like a velvet clip in her hair as well. But I did want to um, put this image in, which was taken in 1903, because that was a time of where hair um, industry was moving on and they were starting to uh, create uh, pro maids and, um, hair, hair um, straighteners. Now that's um, related to Madam C. Walker, who was actually seen uh, negatively that she was trying to make uh, Afro hair, like European hair, but she did actually hate that um, label and said, actually, no, I'm a hair culturist. And why she put, um, put her business together was to maintain hair. So I've been looking at um, Caribbean head wraps and looking at dress in the 18th and 19th century. And what I found is that each island um, has a slightly different nuanced way of dressing. Now you can see there's some uh, topical image here and some photography. And also they have cloth, which is kind of indicative of an island. And it's interesting just looking at the textile um, journey like the madras cloth where it came it has ties to scotland india and then it's shipped to, it was shipped to uh the americas uh, the caribbean in particular uh 
blacks in the Atlantic slave trade. So, I mean, dress and heredom was a way to express individuals' um, style in the slave society. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's incredibly interesting and that's what, um, where my research has taken me. Now, what I do add to the Caribbean also at that time was um, Louisiana and New Orleans because so many people actually uh, migrated after the uh, revolution, the Haiti revolution in 1804. And a lot of people, a lot of free people of color moved to uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. But what's interesting is they, um, in 1786, uh, the governor um, put in a, an edict, a sumptuary law, for women of colour in particular um, to cover their hair and to refrain from excessive attention to dress. Um, and it's kind of, it, it, and it's interesting because it's not as if uh, women, you know, people with Afro hair didn't uh, tie their hair because tying hair or wrapping hair or adorning hair is is, 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 is is a long tradition from Egypt, Africa, from West Africa, South Africa, and particularly in West Africa, um, in Nigeria, they call it the Gele. Obviously, um, a lot of that culture would have been um, moved over to the Caribbean uh, through uh, the slave trade. Uh, the style and the culture, it, it, it passed on. And <clears throat> that's something I'm delving into and looking into a bit more. And, you know, there are different ways of wearing it, but I do think there's a disconnect with head wraps and people dressing and adorning themselves. Like for example, you know, the head wrap is promoted um, through history as a symbol of servitude. Now I, I must admit, I wear a head, a head, head tie, my grandma would say, where's your head tie? In the evenings I put that on and, it's, and that's for um, protection or to just keep my hair out of the way. And then there's dressing your hair like you would wear like on a, on a Sunday or, you know, to actually, dress yourself and that and that's something I'm interested in and that image there of um you know the classic image of the mammy there um with, in Gone with the Wind you know it's kind of indicative of um a, a narrative which is um I think lacking uh, when it comes to uh black female adornment so so now I've been looking at like how images, um, what the symbolism behind some of these images and what I found is actually, they've got different meanings behind them. Now, what I had to do was uh, translate this from French. This has, these um, styles are from the island of Martinique and Guadeloupe. They're Francophile islands um, of the 19th century. So you can see how she's got one point. So one point, it says, means I have a heart to take. So she must be single and ready to mingle, I'm guessing. Um, and then you've got two points. And two points means my heart is full, but you can try your luck. OK. Um, and then three points means I'm a married woman and my heart is definitely bound or definitely married. And then four points, which I haven't seen any images of this one, the four point says, my heart is lightly and welcome to more lovers. Very interesting. And I do think it's interesting when you think about what was happening at the time and how um, black women's bodies were policed. Um, and the more research I'm looking into is actually maybe that uh, clothing and, and dormant and some of it was actually about um, protection and having agency as well, um, you know, and some of the other hair, hair styles or um, hair wrap styles are actually ceremonial. Um, and I just think when I, when I look at like Georgian diaspora, some of the things I've been able to find out, it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's about resilience in these images. It's about beauty and it's about resistance. Um, you know, and the, these 
these images uh, they pr provide uh, information about the sitters. It it I'm able to find out um, about their place in a hostile society and their aspirations beyond it. Um, so in terms of reading images, I just hope uh, that my page inspires people to uh, look look deeper. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Serena. That was really interesting. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat as well at the moment, which you'll be able to see now. I also love that you, Rachel, and I all mentioned or show pictures of pre-Raphaelite women. Um, I think that really speaks to the fact that the handling of their hair and artistic material is still so culturally significant to us and how we think about beauty standards. Um, so yes, everyone at home, please continue to put questions in the chat. I will get to them very soon. But first, I am delighted to introduce Kyle Ring, who is founder of Inheritance. Um, this account and Kyle's research is in celebration of the diversity, complexity and creativity of people of colour and how we choose to style, decorate and care for our hair. Welcome, Kyle. But yeah, thank you again for being with us. It's lovely to have you here. Um, you your account that you run uses an array of photographs, what would have been considered maybe documentary or anthropological at one point, but from what I can tell, a lot of them are staged and um, photographs potentially for marketing purposes, portrait photographs that were probably commissioned and actually a lot of really beautiful candid depictions of people. Um, so I want to start by asking if you could tell us a little bit about what inheritance is and what compelled you to start an initiative where the anchor is all about hair. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I started my page about two or just over two years ago now. Um, and it was just a way to share some of these beautiful old images that I found just kind of from looking around on the internet and also from kind of these vintage postcards that you were talking about. And really the idea of the account is to challenge Western ideas of what's beautiful and also what's acceptable and professional. Um, and when we look at West media, <clears throat> whether that's magazines or TV adverts, I think we're often left with the view that European hair or hairstyles are the default. And then people of color are left feeling like we don't fit in if our hair isn't straight enough or long enough, or even if it's too thick. So the aim of inheritance is to look at the history of our hair and reclaim some of these older traditions um, basically to learn more about our past and empower ourselves to move forward in a more positive and self-accepting way. And you're completely right in terms of the, these older photographs, a lot of them are staged or could be, you know, from studios or and many of them are taken by European photographers. So whilst my aim in finding these older pictures is to look for authenticity, there is, it can be problematic in its own way, as many of the people who are photographed maybe weren't consenting or had no idea where their images um, were going to end up as a lot of these images ended up on postcards for tourists and then were kind of sent internationally around the world. So my aim is with my research is to kind of find as much as I can find out about the images, about the people in them, and look at the wider cultural context. And hopefully through doing this, I can honour those people and give them back some level of dignity. Great, it's such a fantastic project. And I think we have some slides as well that we'll put up yeah. there for you so that everyone can see the details. Um, Great. Yeah. yeah. So that's just a, a kind of screenshot of the account. Yeah, definitely everyone should get on that and follow. Um, yeah, and what you've just said really picks up on a lot of the points that have already been touched on today when I think about it. Now, the images that I found most intriguing when I was also thinking about the relationship between these photographs and our collection are the images of Tahitian women that you have found. So our works by Paul Gauguin, like the one that's on the screen just now, are really highly exoticized and eroticized in many ways, visual examples of Tahitian women. And it, I think it's really interesting to have you here to think about this in terms of the work you've been doing. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the photographs that you've discovered of these real life Tahitian women and um, the beauty ideal that they had in relation to their and actually the purpose of these images as well. Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to kind of go back and talk about some of the, the Gauguin images first, as you say, and how they relate. So the first image I brought up here is um, 
a one of Gauguin's more famous paintings, which is held by the Courtauld, called Nevermore, and it was painted in 1897. Um, and I would like to congratulate the Courtauld actually for having such an honest analysis of the painting on their website, and I suggest everyone check that out. Plus, there was um, there's previous open Courtauld hour session called Rethinking Gauguin, which again was very honest and and definitely worth a watch. But to understand Gauguin's paintings, we have to think a little bit more about him. And he, he disliked modern European civilization and he was looking for a much simpler life in Tahiti. And he's often referred to as a primitivist. Um, and this concept refers to the idea that there's a purity in the natural state associated with specific cultures. So many non-white cultures were deemed to be more primitive and this fed into specific stereotypes, especially of hypersexualization. So non-white women were often viewed as more sexually precocious and Gauguin sought a freedom in Tahiti, but this was inextricably linked with his desire for a sexual freedom as well. So when Gauguin did arrive in Tahiti, things weren't quite as he expected, as Tahiti had been in contact with Christian missionaries for almost 100 years. And so the women were actually dressed much more conservatively than he expected. So in European style clothing, much of their skin was covered and their hair would be kind of tied back into a bun, um, again, in conservative fashion of the time. So Gauguin actually staged many of his paintings to represent this primitive ideal that didn't actually exist. So he would find uh, young girls to model and he'd have them either nude or scantily dressed in pattern textiles which were actually imported from Europe. And then their long dark hair was undone and used to represent their femininity and their youth. And really the innocence of indigenous culture is represented in these young un supposedly untouched girls although this wasn't really true. So the nude figure in this painting is believed to be one of Gauguin's native wives called Pahura, and she was only 15 years old at the time. And he's known to have had relationships with at least three other young girls, all aged between 13 and 14 when he first met them. To understand Gauguin, it's probably helpful to think in his own words. And when he wrote to a friend about this specific painting, he said that the nude was meant to suggest a certain barbarian lost luxury. But I'll kind of leave you to think about what he meant by that. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. So we're going to move forward now. And these are some pictures that I recently shared on, on my inheritance account. Um, so these are portraits of Tahitian women, which were taken by Lucien Gautier um, after Gauguin had died. So he arrived there in 1904 and he was present there for about 16 years. And he took various photographs of landscapes also very much focused on Tahitian women. And his photographs are quite similar to Gauguin's paintings. Um, and in fact, many of the women are wearing the same prints and you can see those prints on the women there. Um, and their hair is always free flowing and decorated with flowers. But to understand why hair is represented in this way, it's important to kind of look deeper at the colonial context. So first I actually looked into traditional Polynesian hair culture and it's extremely complex. So hairstyles historically could represent social status, tribal affiliation, rites of passage, or even reflect mythological origins. But generally both men and women would have long hair and it would usually be worn in long braids down their back or it would be tied into a bun. And men would wear their hair in variously styled top knots, which, and, uh, excuse my pronunciation, but were either called tiki, putiki, kuku or rahiri. So there were lots of different styles of tying the, the what's now called just the top knot. Um, and hair would be combed using implements made from wood or bone and dressed with oil or clay pigment. And there are also multiple early accounts of women having short hair cropped to their ears. But if we read about hair in Polynesian society now, you'll be told that hair, long hair is a sign of femininity, but this just wasn't always true. And much of this is due to commodification of culture, which occurred at the hands of Gauguin and Gautier. So when Europeans started colonizing, they were obsessed with categorizing people racially. And so Europeans tried to delineate between different populations in the Pacific Islands based on physical features. So true Polynesians and Tahitians were counted as this, were viewed as more civilized with fairer skin and straighter hair, whilst people we now refer to as Melanesians who were darker skinned and more, had more Afro textured hair were viewed as more volatile and backwards. And Europeans basically created a hierarchy of development according to what their own ideas were about civilization. 
So the same way I mentioned earlier about native women being viewed as sexually precocious, they also felt that differences between the sexes were less marked if you were less civilized. And so this is referred to as sexual dimorphism, where there's a focus on physical attributes other than your sexual organs, which differentiate between men and women. So Europeans saw themselves as the most civilized as they felt that the differences between men and women were the most marked. And this fed into sexism in Europe, where women were hyper-feminized and confined to domesticity, but the same idea was transported abroad, and men were made to cut their hair short, and women were encouraged to keep their hair longer in order to present themselves as more civilized. But these ideas now extend beyond hair to issues with women's facial features and body habitus, and this is still felt today by many women of color. I would suggest that we think more deeply about what femininity really is, and I'd venture to say that it goes beyond a single feature such as long silky hair. Um, if we go to the last slide. So I just want to show you some of these portraits. So these portraits were um, taken by Samuel Carnell in New Zealand of Maori women um, in the late 19th century. And as you can see, these Polynesian women don't fit neatly into the binarized European classifications of race or gender. And unfortunately, much of the pre-colonial information on Polynesian culture has been lost. But I think these photographs hopefully provide a counterbalance to those other more exoticized images we have from Gauguin and Gautier. And I'll leave it there. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, it is really interesting when you think about a cultural perspective of here in the UK and this idea of long flowing hair and actually not even just the UK, just the way that we think of that now is like the, the ideal, but also back um, in Gauguin's times, the fact having wild and loose hair was indicative and emblematic of some kind of sexual looseness and backwardness, um, especially in these photographs that you're saying as well, the fact that they could trickle in and through and infiltrate the daily lives of people in the West. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, you know, like a, a postcard, what's that? You think of that as a completely unharmful thing, but actually just the fact that it's sexualized and made people other, it was really, really um, important. So yes. And those were the same things that encouraged people to travel to Tahiti in the first place. So people would have seen Gauguin's paintings and Gautier would have seen that. And that's what he was expecting again when he went and wanted to take his photographs. So it kind of perpetuates the same thing. Definitely. So thank you very much for that. Um, I really urge everyone to check out Kyle's archive to learn more. There's so much more we could have said, so many different images. Um, but it's now time for us to go to the Q&A portion of the evening. So I'm going to invite the rest of our speakers to come back on camera and unmute themselves. And we do have quite a few questions in already, and we probably won't have time to get through them all. I'm gonna say that now. Um, but the first one that we have is one for everyone. Um, it's, do you have a favorite model from art history whose hair is central to the most of the artworks that they're depicted in, or a favourite artist who depicts hair? That's a hard one. I'm also just trying to think if I actually have a favourite artist. I guess um, when I was growing up, something that I was really obsessed with was like the Bollywood advertising images and the way the women's hair looked. I don't know if anyone else, Shigifta, I'm looking at you, if you were obsessed, like just how sleek their hair used to look. Um, but yeah, does anyone have anyone? Rachel, do you have a favorite? I mean, I feel like with, I mean, it's a bit dark in here, but red hair, I do have red hair and I do love a pre raffle I mean, it goes without saying, it's just like, it's a good, it's a good period for painting long red hair, which is uh, my particular favorite. But also, you know, when you read about those muses, like so, uh, you know, Elizabeth Siddle, Fanny Cornforth, all those people, you know, there's a lot of really interesting kind of tragic stories behind those women. And as a few people have mentioned, you know, we're only ever seeing one version of these muses. We're not hearing their life stories, but I, yeah, I have a personal passion for long red hair, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. I also, like the way red hair, red hair is so interesting in art as, as well, like it being a sign of witches and vampires historically and then like sex workers and it, and also the fact that people like red hair because it shows up really well on canvas, you know, so red hair is a really interesting topic anyway and I guess I have a, a vested interest too. <laughs> Great and Serena do you have a favourite? 
Um, that's that's a hard one. Um, I mean, with Afro hair, it's so like it's really versatile. Like you can do so much with it. Um, that's what I, I love about it. And you can be so different and have braids and then just have it out one one time. Um, and yeah, and it's fashioned and, and painted in so many different ways. It's um, it's endless, really, um, what you can do uh, and how you can make it look. And it's and it's a political issue as well. Um, I think many people know that. And it was funny how you started with saying um, don't touch people's hair. Uh, yeah. And I think that that's important. And um, it, you know, it, it is political and, I, and I've had like direct messages um on Georgian diaspora where people will say to me like one one I think it was about a month ago somebody was like oh um African Americans should allow us to touch your hair and talk about your clothing I mean and I was just like what do you, do you know what I mean it's uh it's it's interesting how it can rile people up it does I think people want to have the power to have to touch people and I just think it's just never acceptable. I actually, yeah. one of the reasons that I started to get so interesting, interested in art, in um, the hair and art even, is the fact that when I grew up in Scotland, people used to come up to me on the street and feel like they could touch my hair when I was a child. Just when I, when I was quite young, I think people stopped doing it when I got a bit bigger and I looked a bit scarier, I think. But I just really struck me my whole life that people just felt like they had the authority to just do that and it's like it's not acceptable <laughs> well, no it's not acceptable to um you know to touch anyone um without consent um yeah it's quite weird if you ask me um and if you feel like that um you should kind of check yourself i think before you reach out to actually touch touch people definitely and kyle and shigufta do you have a favorite artist or a model in art I think, um, unfortunately, I guess Western art has very much overlooked people of colour, whether that's kind of looking at Afro hair specifically or other things. And I think the portrayals are usually very Orientalist or maybe don't really present the people in the best way. Um, there was a recent uh, show, which actually I missed, which was over at the Tate, and it was like a, um, a show by... Um, I need to get the name and I'll put it here. Zanelli Moholy, and it's a, a photographic show. And I think that beautifully highlighted kind of Afro hair and how diverse it is. So I think we'd probably be looking to more modern artists nowadays to kind of have their own voice and say about how they're represented. And I, I very much echo what Kyle has said in terms of even the poem was looking at what's missing in, in the frame. Um, but when it comes to sort of just looking at everyday people or, or hair, I'm one of those people. I, I have I have wavy hair, so it's not curly and it's not straight. So I'm jealous of people who have really straight hair or really curly hair. I want to have short hair. I'm jealous of people who have long hair. Um, and when I have long hair, I really want short hair. So I'm, I'm just one of those people I just <laughs> I'm never satisfied. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me too. Definitely. Um, the next question that we have is also quite interesting and it's for everyone. It's, have you ever tried any of the adornments you've shown us today in your own hair? And if you have like a wildest hair story <laughs> as well. I've personally tried lots of different things with my hair over time. So my hair, I've obviously covered it up because I've just washed it today, but my hair is currently in locks and I've had locks now for um, about a year. Um, but I've had, you know, short hair, long hair, I've had braids, I've had extensions, I've shaved it all off completely. Um, and I really do think, you know, hair is, is a great way for us to express ourselves and also just connect with different aspects of our identity. Um, so yes, and I'm sure this isn't the end of my hair journey. We'll see where we end up. <laughs> Amazing. Has anyone else done? I've, I've dabbled in hijab wearing. <laughs> I don't know if you, can, if you can say that, but um, so I sometimes wear the hijab, sometimes I don't. Um, and I something I've always loved as a child is um, in Punjabi culture, we have something called a baranda, which is um, usually gold thread um, and you tie it into the hair and it sort of hangs really 
quite heavy at the bottom you've got like a really beautiful um embroidered piece or you've got beads and it's really beautiful um and I, I even as a grown-up I just walk around the house wearing it and just walk flick it around um but I don't always have the nerve to wear it out and about because I feel like um it would just draw too much attention it's very unusual here whereas in the Punjab you would wear it I, I think it's becoming out of fashion now but you would wear it more regularly and there have been times where I've worn traditional clothes and I've been met with not always hostility but sometimes I think quite where people are showing that oh this looks lovely but it's just really patronizing and then suddenly I think oh maybe maybe I don't want to wear traditional clothing because it marks me out as, as a particular kind of person um, where I can be spoken to in a particular way, which I've seen happen with my mother as well. So I think it's, a, yeah, it's really difficult to say that you embrace certain parts of your culture or hair styles that are associated with, with particular traditions um, without being met with um, not always hostility, but, but something that's negative. Mm. Yeah, I remember, well, from my family anyway, from the Indian side, alopecia is a massive problem in the women's side. And I think that's something that's hardly ever discussed um, for South Asian women mm -hmm. in any kind of media. I think there is still a massive, just orientalist vision of what South Asian women look like, what their hair look like and how they act and behave. So I think that idea of, you know, having really beautiful adornments in your hair and feeling worried about wearing them out, also feeds into that kind of culture as well. Uh, There's a brilliant book by um, a novelist called Ziba Talkani, who's written um, in, in depth about her hair journey and the problems of, of growing up in a South Asian community and having hair loss. Um, and that's called My Past, uh, My Past is in a Foreign Country. So if you wanted to read about that, that's a really good insight into what it means to be somebody who's struggling with hair loss at a young age within the South Asian community where hair does mean, it has carried so much. Definitely, I'll be ordering that after this event. And Serena and Rachel, what about you both? Um, I guess, um, yeah, with he head wraps, um, I mean, I do wear them, um, but not in the same way that you saw um, in the presentation. But that is something I definitely want to look into, like actually um, making these head wraps and seeing how they were, like, they were actually put together. There's um, uh, a woman called uh, Diane Honoré and she's actually um, learning how, um, doing workshops uh, in New Orleans and Louisiana on how to actually make them and as a way um, to bring culture and identity back, which is really interesting. So the more research I do, that's something um, I would I would love to do actually and use my dress cloth and yeah just see how how it looks as well yeah yeah especially now that you've shown us all the language of all the different meanings you can have day by day you can be a different person <laughs> perform a different well, yeah. you have four peaks <laughs> oh wow <well. laughs> i'm not gonna tell you that <laughs> i'm slightly worried what my headband's saying about me today <laughs> <laughs> some hidden meaning <laughs> um, and Rachel what about you oh, I feel like one of like kind of the most interesting elements of my job working with hairdressers and with hair brands and things is like kind of the way that product development and tool development uh impacts on trends and I mean this is nothing new obviously hair tools and scissors and combs and everything have been around in every culture for a very very long time but I feel like that's something that sort of going into the future and just seeing which kind of impacts on which and why do we start developing hair tools to do a specific type of thing? Is it the trend that's driving it or is it the opposite way around? And kind of seeing the rise and fall in my generation of super straight hair, super curly hair, now we've moved into a place where it seems to be, we're reaching a level of peace with our natural texture to some extent. And, you know, I, I'm very interested in how product and technology is supporting what goes on with hair. And I guess it's like a perk of the job having been able to try lots of different tools over the years. I've ended up trying lots of different things, but yeah, I find that side of things super interesting. And it's it's interesting to see, particularly coming out of lockdown, all the big changes that are happening with hair trends and what people are doing and why they're doing it. And it will be interesting, I think, to look back in a couple of years and the hair we all ended up with coming out of lockdown <laughs> and what's happened to it have we kept things have we changed things yeah I find that particularly interesting yeah definitely and um, well so we're almost out of time but I just wanted to read a really interesting comment that's come into the chat it's about the contemporary world um, including South America 
And it's about the fact that some women shave their head after a rape. That is a traumatic situation and also a symbol to self affirmation, which I think is really interesting, something I hadn't actually heard before. But yeah, um, that is sadly all we have time for today. I feel like we could all talk about hair for many, many hours. And I wanted to just end by thanking you all so much for being such wonderful guests. Um, and I can't wait for us all to go to the gallery and actually think about the hairstyles um, of the subjects of our paintings, drawings and sculptures when we open. I think it'll be really great. And we can even maybe have some pop-up actual hairstyling stops around the gallery. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to thank Bloomberg for their support and everyone at home for tuning in. Please do sign up to our last open quartiled hour of the term, which will be on a night at a theater. And we're gonna be thinking about our works that relate to dance and movement more generally. Um, so yeah, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evenings. Good night and thank you guys. Thanks Thank everyone. Thank you for having us. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye bye.